I'd like to invite you this morning back to our ongoing series in Paul's letter to the Philippians. So we will be in chapter 2 of the New Testament letter of Philippians. Last time we were in this letter, you'll remember that we approached the previous verses in a way that was somewhat different than perhaps I had ever done. Um, we contrasted the character of the Lord Jesus Christ in his willingness to journey from the glory of heaven and to the glory of his union with the Father and to descend in humility and sacrifice, whereas we contrasted that with the Old Testament images of the evil one and how he chose to exalt himself and how that downfall forms for us a picture of the foundations of the kingdom of darkness. And now we, we are those who celebrate, who give thanks to the Father, as Colossians 1 says, thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light because he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And we celebrated that, and I love these songs that Janelle chose for us this morning, uh, these songs that think of him and his, did I say Janelle? What did I say? Oh, Kathy. So, so Kathy played and Janelle chose the songs. <laughs> now you're all confused, aren't you? <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Kathy, for those lovely songs. Thank you, Janelle, for playing for us. I was digressing a little there. But in a really solid sense, and you've heard me say this before, I don't know what size shoes or sandals he would wear. But he does have a shoe size. And we're told in Scripture that he has been exalted to the highest place at the right hand of God the Father and beneath his feet everything is under his reign and authority and control. History is marching forward and it's moving at his command. So no matter how chaotic things may seem at times, how confusing, how upside down our culture may seem, and how at times disheartening we feel when we see the moral de uh, decadence and the moral corruption that is not only permeating our culture but even celebrated now in our culture maybe as never before. That's where we find ourselves. But we are not to be discouraged because as amazing as it is, the Bible teaches us that that one who is now at the right hand of God, that we celebrate that name that's above every name, before whom every knee will one day bow and every tongue confess. If you're a child of God and you've been born of his spirit and you've come to faith in Christ, you are in spiritual union with him who's at God's right hand. And that's a reason to celebrate no matter what our culture does, right? So there is always this sense in the believer's life, yours and mine, where on one hand, I love my country and I care about my country and I care about society and I, I grieve at times at what I see going on all around me. But there's another side of me that says, yeah, but what's that to me? I'm God's child. And no matter how, how smelly, how, how dark, how dismal, and how, how uh, odorous the compost pile is, 
the most beautiful of plants and vegetables and flowers can grow out of that compost, right? And in a sense, we've been placed in that compost pile and we're to grow as his beloved children. Well, this morning, of all the topics that we could talk about, there's probably none more important to you personally and to me personally as the topic for today. It is the topic of your own salvation. Your own salvation, which is the way it's expressed in the text that we're going to be looking at. So I'd like you to follow with me as I read today's text, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit as it relates to your own salvation and mine. Verse 12 of chapter 2 of Philippians reads, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, I was justified, declared righteous by God through faith in Jesus Christ. It was at that point that I was delivered from the penalty of sin. How do I know that? Because so much of the New Testament uh, amplifies that. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. What's that saying? Penalty has been paid. I don't pay my own penalty. Someone else did. And so... When you think about your salvation, think of it in the past tense in the sense that you've been delivered from the penalty of sin. Secondly, there is also the present tense, what we would call sanctification in a general sense. Sanctification, not justification, but sanctification that's setting us apart for God. And in that sense, Sanctification speaks of not the deliverance from the penalty of sin, but deliverance from the power of sin over our lives. It no longer can reign over the believer's life because he's been united with Christ and made alive. And so as we learned in the class this morning, even so consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we're delivered from the penalty, Past tense, we're delivered from the power of sin controlling us in the present tense and then in the future tense, which the Bible would call glorification, that final state when we're finally at home and this old battle is over. In glorification, we are delivered from the very presence of sin. Now, we can't even fathom that. We can't even fathom it that sin will be a thing of the past. It will be gone forever. And you've heard me say this before, and I know it maybe seems trite, but it's precious to me. Because so much of sin isn't just something that I do in a corner. Sin often involves other people. And it affects relationships. And it confuses them and it causes discord, and it causes pain and bitterness and all kinds of things, personal clashes with others. Imagine we're all home now, and we've been there 10,000 years, and I bump into one of you and I say, hey, how's things going? And you say, you know what's the most amazing thing? We've been here 10,000 years, and I have not heard one cross word. I have not heard a bitter remark. I have not felt, thought, or seen anyone else express sinful lust toward anyone else. It's a thing that's gone. Won't that be a great day? Won't we all say good riddance? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we will. So when you think of your salvation, think of it in the past as deliverance from the penalty of sin because Christ bore it on the cross for you. When you think of present tense salvation, 
Lord, I'm in the process of growing, and you have delivered me from the power of sin. It can no longer reign over me and control me. Oh, it rages from time to time momentarily. But then the Lord cleans me back up. I may require a slight spanking, but he gets me back on the track I should be on, and I'm walking with him as I should, and the power of sin over my life is broken. And then ultimately when we arrive home, the very presence of sin is gone forever. Won't that be a great day? So just remember that, those three tenses when you Now, let's unpack this passage a little bit. When it comes to your own salvation, first of all, you are precisely where God wants you to be. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, believe it or not, verse 15 tells us that we're right where we're supposed to be. Look at it again so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, where? In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Lord, that's your idea of where I can grow best? It is. That's what occurs, and we now carry his name. But... Lord, that's not enough just to have the name and to have so that I'm actually your child. And God says, I've done that too. The spirit of adoption, and I've made you my own. And so you're, a, in a sense, uh, in two ways God's child, one by adoption and the other by new birth. And when you are born of his spirit, you become new on the inside, and God changes you. So that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And those new things that have come are just going to keep coming. There's no end to them. None. Throughout this life, they just keep coming and coming and coming until eventually we're home. And he's fulfilled his promise to take us where he is. Remember in John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, I desire also that those whom thou hast given me be with me where I am so that they can behold my glory, the glory which was mine before the world was created. We're going to see Christ and see his magnificence and see his glory when we're finally home. What a day that's going to be. So you are precisely where God wants you to be in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. No surprise. Here we are. But you're also precisely who I've declared you to be, my beloved children who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have banked everything on him. And then thirdly, and this is where application comes in, you know precisely how God calls you to live. That, in a sense, is what Paul is saying. And that's why he does what he does. He says, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Kathy works at the high school, you know, and every once in a while she has to step out of the room. And just for a moment, and then comes back. You know, a lot of things can happen in a classroom in, in a few minutes when the teacher steps out. Have you ever noticed that? That's kind of what Paul's saying here. It's important that you walk in obedience to Christ, not as in my presence only, but even more in my absence, because you're vulnerable. Now, I think there's a place for that, don't you? I love being with you. There are Sunday mornings I get up and I think, man, I need to be with God's family. I need to see their eyes. I need to see their smiles. I need to shake their hands. And I need to listen to them pray and listen to them sing. I just am lonely for being with God's children. And when I'm with you, and you don't know this about me. You know, I'm not always flying high. You all assume that I come 
waltzing into here on Sunday morning ready to thunder the word. That's not so. I'm just like you. I have ups and downs and mood swings, and I used to be much more melancholy than I am now. Kathy would vouch for that. But sometimes I just need that bit of a boost, that prompting that comes from being with God's children, being with others who have a heart to follow him. Don't you feel that way? Aren't you affected by others who know and love the Lord? Well, I know I am. And so this third point, you know precisely how God calls you to live. And what I've done is I've just taken each of these verses and put it in a principle form. And uh, I want to say this. There is a teaching out there, and it's always been out there. It's sort of a quietistic preach, uh, way of looking at the Christian life, as though all you do is passively surrender yourself to the Lord, and he'll do all the rest. And there's little... There's these little quotes, uh, let, let go and let God, and these, but I'm biblical. They give part of the truth. There is a place, be still and know that I'm God. Wait upon me when you don't know what to do. Be quiet. There's a place for that. But when it comes to our sanctification and our growth, our salvation, it is not an either or. It's both and. It's God in his enabling power and grace working within us, and it's us with devotion and determination asserting ourselves to, to live out what God is working within us. It's both and. And that's so important to understand. So as we look at this, this is how I did it, you guys. I hope it resonates with you as it should drawing on his divine enablement each believer is called first of all to lovingly obey him we are his now in first corinthians six nineteen, it says you don't even own yourself you've been bought with a price therefore glorify god and so this life of obedience to him uh, that's a word that we don't hear enough among us. How's your walk with the Lord? Are you obeying him? If I bumped into you this week and said that to you, you'd be taken back. Because most of the time we want to know how you're feeling. I don't want to know how you're feeling. I want to know how you're walking, right? How are you walking with him? And so look at verse 12. So then, beloved... My beloved, just as you've always obeyed, there's that word, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that's the second point. God working within us and us working out what he's doing by his word, by his spirit. And so this, this walk, this salvation of ours is the Working out what God is working in. And so it's both and and not an either or. And so not only loving obedience to him, but verse 13, grateful reverence to him. And that idea there, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now this is not the kind of is this isn't a, a craven fear. This isn't a dread of punishment. But it is, in the context, it's I'm in union with the one that God has exalted to his right hand. If that doesn't stir some kind of reverence within us, I don't know what we need. Probably not another piece of turkey. I'm in union with him. That calls for a sense of reverence and wonder, if not trembling, right? And so work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Then by his divine enablement, enablement each believer is also called to heartily serve him. And if you look there at verse 14, Oh, by the way, we missed verse 13. Uh, why do we work it out the way we do? Because it's God who's at work in you. 
both to will and to uh, carry out, to work his good pleasure. But verse 14 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, without whining, without belly aching, without, and we could, I could have pulled up these Greek terms and we could have dug into them and, and seen different nuances and so on, but on the flip side of this, what's he really saying? Well, what I think what he's really saying is heartily serve him. And if you'll serve him from your heart, you'll find that you're not grumbling about it, right? And you're not disputing about it. So that's the positive side of Paul's warning here. Don't be grumblers and don't be disputing, but serve him from your heart. And then verse 15. There's a fascinating verse when you see the whole verse. We're to radiantly display him. There's to be something, you know, that there's a, there's a psalm that says they looked unto him and their faces were radiant and they were not ashamed. There's a kind of radiance. Do you remember what happened when they drug Stephen before the council and he delivered that great message, that stirring message of the history of Israel, bringing it all the way up and charging them with being stiff-necked and uncircumcised, rejecting as, the old, as their fathers had. Now they, they've rejected Christ himself. And, and Stephen pulls no punches. And it says they, they just gnashed their teeth and came upon him, dragged him out to stone him. But it says that in that text there that they looked upon Stephen and his face was radiant like the face of an angel. The Spirit of God had filled him as he testified to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his authority that they would all one day face if they did not repent and turn to him. But look at verse 15. So that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, now watch carefully, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Luminaries is the term that we get luminaries from this very term. That you have a radiant way about you in character, in disposition, in heart toward those that you interact with. Which is such a contrast with grumbling and disputing, isn't it? My mom used to always say the same. I was such a melancholy kid. And uh, my mom would say, Tony, what are you stewing about? That's the way she would put it. You better quit that stewing. It's all over your face. You been stewing lately? You been grumbling lately? Disputing lately? Stop that. Appear as lights in the world. And finally then, not only are we to lovingly obey, gratefully revere, heartily serve him, radiantly reflect or display him, but finally, we're to accurately represent him. And we see that in verse 16. Holding fast the word of life which is just another way of saying the gospel. Holding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that in the day of Christ, Paul writes, I will have reason to glory, to celebrate, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. And I find, don't you find it fascinating? I hope you catch it like I do from time to time. Paul seems to always be living with this interesting mindset. He knows that he's living on the short side of things. Our life here on earth. This is the short side, you guys. But Paul is always thinking about the long side. And that how we live now makes a difference on the long side. And so he just throws that in. 
Don't you, you? It's a strange way to talk. You know, our world doesn't talk this way. They don't think like this. Paul says, I want you to hold forth the word of life, the gospel, so that as a result, in the day of Christ, the long side, I will have reason to celebrate, to glory, and to rejoice. Why? Because I did not, on the short side, run in vain, nor toil in vain. Short side, long side. And I think that is a mindset, a worldview, a way that a believer lives and thinks. He realizes the whole of my life is the short side. And I'm, I'm just on, when, I, when I'm 90, if I make it that long, I'll be just barely on the doorstep of stepping into the long side what God has in store for me. So let's live it. We know how. God says, I've told you precisely how to live. Obey me, revere me, serve me, re reflect me, and accurately represent me. Where? Amidst a crooked and perverse generation. That's where, because I have you precisely where I want you to be, and, and you are precisely who I've said you are. Isn't that a really practical section of Scripture? It is, isn't it? It is. Well, I think that's about as much as I want to give today. Um, do we have a closing song, Janelle? Oh, the doxology. Very good. Well, let's all...